buenos días. I'm Rhonda Gonzalez Manzanares. I'm the Dean of Library Services here at CSU Pueblo, um, the Colorado Chicano Movement Archives, and also the Aslan Research Center are affiliated with the library. So um, it's our great pleasure to put on this <coughs> me, annual Summer Institute. I saw this smoke we've been having. Is, has it messed any of you up too? <coughs> this is our fourth annual Aslan Research Center Summer Institute. And four years ago, we were in the same ballroom in just a little fourth of it with 30, 30 attendees. And this year we had capped the registration at 200. So we are so excited that you all wanna come every summer and meet with us and talk about um, issues every year, a different topic, but issues that relate to our region, and our students. Um, so thank you for being here. I would like to just get a few housekeeping things out of the way and then I'm gonna introduce our provost. So first of all, I just wanted to thank our sponsors. So mainly we are sponsored by the Hispanic Serving Institutions uh, office here at CSU Pueblo. So um, Dr. Derek Lopez and Chris Beltran, thank you so much for your support to make this happen. I'd like to just recognize the folks that were on our planning committee. So if you're in the room, will you just uh, stand up when I say your name? April Bojorquez, she's waving over there, uh, is our new interim director of the Aslan Research Center. I'll introduce her in a moment. Charlene Garcia Sims, who you know. Erin Cavio-Stresso, she uh, was at the registration table. Yep, Chris Beltran, again. Uh, Julie Stevens is my assistant. She is wandering around assisting and helping. Wanda Bustos from Chris's office. Uh, and Stacy Curry, who is uh, our outreach librarian, and she's our tech lady for today. And Ale Dr. Rivadanera Alegrias, who will be our keynote. Thank you to these people. They put a lot of time and effort to help make today happen. Uh, just a couple of logistics. Hopefully you all saw that the restrooms are just outside to the left. Uh, please feel free to go back out and get coffee or juice or more breakfast or whatever you need to do um, throughout the day. We will have breaks. We will have a wonderful lunch, but we do have a packed agenda. So if you need to get up and walk around, we understand. Um, and I think the Wi-Fi password was up on the wall if anybody needed it, hopefully you got it. And that is about it for logistics. At this time, I'd like to welcome our provost, Gail Mackin, and she will be saying a few words and welcoming you on behalf of the university, Dr. Mackin. attending this conference today from our own faculty, staff, and students. Uh, we have visiting community guests and visitors from surrounding colleges and universities. So welcome to CSU Pueblo. We're very excited that you're here. So we have been uh, a proud uh, Hispanic serving institution for uh, since 2005, I believe, when the uh, the United States Department of Education designated our institution uh, for having more than 25% Hispanic students enrolled for full time. Currently, CSU Pueblo's student body is one of the most diverse in Colorado, with over 55% of our students, or I'm sorry, nearly 55% of our students coming from minority backgrounds. Our Hispanic students represent a diverse spectrum of experiences and backgrounds that range from recent immigrants from Spanish-speaking countries to indigenous peoples of the United States who were colonized by the Spanish. Regardless of background, Spanish language is, vital, is a vital component 
of culture for our students and their families. We want to do an excellent job of respecting their culture by learning as much about as much as we can about our students' diverse needs and preferences for bilingual services at the university. We strive to remove barriers for students and to provide welcoming and supportive environments for all students. To that end, we are fostering linguistic servingness for our bilingual Spanish-speaking population by creating a bilingual outreach effort and expanding our cultural representation to include a robust ballet folklorico. I always trip over that word, I don't know why. <clears throat> Um, and that program is led by Iska Marino. We have trained cohorts of students and staff in language justice who can translate to Spanish, our Spanish-speaking populations. We are currently implementing grant-funded programs such as Camp HEP that serve migrant populations led by Dr. Victoria Obregón and have heritage Spanish-speaking courses offered by Dr. Viva Vineda, who's online now. We know that supporting our bilingual staff is also important. We need to recognize their efforts and the importance of their skills and services that they provide as they are the bridge of the Spanish-speaking population in our community and beyond. So I want to thank all of you for doing the hard work to help our, our students um, and our community um, emerge. Um, and, uh, so, and for supporting our CSU Pueblo and our efforts to be an excellent Hispanic serving institution. Enjoy your day, uh, enjoy your, your com the company of the people around you, and, and have a wonderful time. Thank you. All right, at this time I'd like to call up April Bujorquez. Um, many of you may know April already, but in case you don't, she is our new interim director of the Aslan Research Center, and she comes to us with a wealth of experience. She and her husband run the nonprofit Desert Art Lab here in Pueblo, and she's been a, a cultural exhibit and museum director at a number of institutions of higher ed, including St. Mary's College of California, um, Kansas State University, and also curator of the National Hispanic Cultural Center Art Museum in Albuquerque. So we're so lucky to have April here, and she's going to introduce our first speaker.
first of all, can you all hear me? Yes, you hear me. Well, my heart is broken that I can't be with you today. I have been looking forward to this for three months since Dean uh, Gonzalez Manzanada started working on it. But guess what? I got COVID. I tested positive, positive yesterday. So there you go. For those of you who know me, you know I mask everywhere. So how did this happen? I don't know, but I dodged it for four years. So far, so good. And I am just so happy that we have all this great technology so I can be with you today. Also, the camera is pointing at you, so I will get the joy of watching you as I am presenting. Well, before I start, I want to thank Dean Gonzalez Manzanares for her amazing, amazing first, first of all, organizational skills. You don't know what comes in, what goes into something like this, and her dedication to the Astra Center. I want to help. Uh, I want to thank April. She's so great, and I was really hoping to hug her today, and this happened. But she has already shown she's a great director and also has such a big heart. She was always asking me how I was doing when I told her I was sick. Also, Charlene Garcia Sims, who is so talented and will be reading a poem for us today during my presentation. Julie and Wanda for doing all the paperwork. Chris Beltran, Derek and Aaron for their support, and Stacy and Brent for getting all this uh, uh, videos and things going on that apparently are working because you're all looking like you are seeing me and listening to me, so that's good. I think we're good. I also want to say I really wanted to meet Melissa in person today. Melissa! Hola hermosa! We had such a great conversation and I didn't get to hug her, so that's okay. Another time will be when we do it. But now, let's move to my presentation. All righty. Big question here, important one. Can you all see my slides? Yes. Yes, yes they can see it. Yay, wonderful. So my talk today is Embracing Identity Exploration Through Language Studies at a Hispanic Serving Institution. I'm gonna talk about four things. I'm gonna talk about what is a language, then I'm going to talk about language and identity. We will then move to talking about critical language awareness, which is very important when you're talking about language and identity. And lastly, I'll talk about preserving languages at CSU Pueblo. But before we get started, we're going to do some fun things. This is interactive. You're not going to be bored, I promise. So uh, before we start, find a person close to you Probably somebody you don't know too well, and introduce yourself. Tell them a little bit about you. And try to remember what they're saying because there will be a quiz. All right, so I'm going to give you about three minutes to turn to somebody and introduce yourself and tell them a little bit about you. Let's do it. Hopefully you already made a new friend today. 
exciting is that? Wow. I love it. Thank you. Thank you for sharing some aspects of your identity today with somebody who maybe you just met. What you did right now is absolutely extraordinary. I thought you really realized how extraordinary it is. You make sounds, you formed words, and with those sounds and those words, the other person was listening to you and decoded your sounds and your words into a message. Of course, we never think of language this way. We never think how extraordinary it is that we have this ability to make sounds and symbols that have meaning and then have somebody else decode them for us. Because we're so used to it, we do it every day. But this is truly extraordinary. And that is what I want to talk to you about today. Because it is through language that we form our identities. So, I want to get to know you a little bit more. I am going to ask you, we're going to give this a try. We'll see if it works. If it doesn't, we'll skip it. But if you point your phones at this QR code, you will go into a little thing where you're going to be able to interact with me. And then uh, I will be able to share some of your thoughts with the whole room without having you um, have to get up there and get embarrassed. <laughs> and so what you need to do is either go to join.earpod.com and type that number. You can just do the QR code. And as you do it, you should be able to uh, come into this Nearpod. The Nearpod will show up on your phone, and it'll be some slides that we will see. And how are we doing? Are we able to get in there? Yes, we have some hands that say, yes. oh yeah, I got 10 people already. Ooh, let's see if we can get more than 10 people. Let's see if a few more of you can get, can get there. Yes, Araceli, I see you. I see you in there. Woo! We got 36 already. Oh, you guys are talented. Look at you. Oh my goodness, now we got 56. Okay, we're really good at this. We're really good at this. I love it. The numbers keep climbing. The numbers keep climbing. Ooh, I got 70 people already. Ooh, let's see if we can make it to 80. When we make it to 80, I'm going to go ahead and launch some fun questions so we get to know each other a little bit better. Woo! And there we are. There's a whole bunch of us in there. Hey, if you haven't gotten in there yet, don't worry. You'll get a chance to hear in a minute as well. Oh, now we got 85. You guys are a talented bunch, I can tell. All right, so the first thing I'm going to ask you is where are you coming from? If you're faculty, your staff, you're a student, let's get an idea of who is in the room. So let's go ahead and please go ahead and pick who you are. If you're a teacher in the community, a community member, a student, a staff, or faculty. Once I get this, I'm going to share this with all of you so we can get a little bit of a sense of who is who. share it with you. So about 37% uh, of you are community members, 23% of you are staff, 15% haven't answered yet, so you're trying to decide who you are. That's okay, because it's all about exploring identity. 6.4% <laughs> of you are students, and 2.7% of you are community members, uh, uh, I mean uh, teachers in the community. So we have a pretty good, uh, a pretty good mix here. Yay, community members! Forty-four percent of you. This is fantastic. So now we're going to ask. Uh, I'm going to ask you about our language abilities. So please tell me, do you speak one language? Do you speak two languages? Do you speak three or more languages? Ooh, let's see what kind of multilingual bunch we have here. I can't wait to find this out. <laughs> wow. Ooh, it looks like we have at least one multilingual person. This is fantastic. 
All right, we can see here that almost half of us here speak at least two languages. And about 30% of us speak only one language. Don't worry, don't worry. Monolingualism can be cured. I can help you, and so can many people here. And then we have 11% of you who speak uh, three or more languages. So yay multilinguals, this is fantastic, I love it. Thank you for sharing this because this gives me an idea of where we are in our language skills. The last question I'm going to ask you is if you learned it, this, your second language or third language. Did you learn it at home, at elementary or middle school, in high school or in college? So let's see what this group has to say about that. Where did you learn your language that is other than English here? Let's find out. Ooh, we have a few people who are telling me, oh, goodness, my heart is going to be so happy. At least a quarter of you have learned it at home. Oh, more than that. 40% of you learned the language other than English at home. Wow. And about 11% of you learned it in high school. Yay! Hey, about 9% of you learned it in college. So those are my beautiful students too. And I congratulate you for that incredible effort. And hey, there's a small group of you who even learned it in elementary or middle school. This is quite remarkable because this shows us how you have acquired your language. All right, so now that I know a little bit more about you, and you all know a little bit more about us, we are going to talk a little bit about what is a language. Are we ready? Okay, I see some, I see some nods, so I am going to assume we are ready. And I need to ask you something. Do you see a big dark block in the screen or not? No. Or do you see my full slide? Raise your hand and you see full slide. Oh, but, all right, okay. I just wanted to make sure, because sometimes my little squares get weird, and I just wanted to make sure you were seeing the full slides. Okay, so let's get to what is a language. Have you ever even thought of this? Okay, here's a scenario. This lady says, And then the other lady has a big question mark over her head. That's because she doesn't have the code system to decode this language. Does anybody know what this person is saying? Anybody? Not even Marisa. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> this is Quechua for those of you who don't know. And of course, I don't expect any of you to have this code. Now, I say, good morning. What is your name? Who understood that? <laughs> oh, yes, because that is a code we share. And this connects us together in order to decode. I'm going to run a couple experiments on you. I always love doing this with my students. I am going to say the word apple, and I want you to picture an apple. Have you done that? Are you picturing it? All right. Now, what apple did you see? Can you point at it? Oh! Some of you may have seen a green apple, or there's a red apple, or there's one of those Fuji apples. You know, there's a reason why you do that. It has to do with your life experiences and where you're coming from. And so, this is important to know when we're decoding, we're decoding from our own context. Let me do another one. Christmas. Okay, anybody? Anybody has now pictured Christmas? All right. Which one? Point. Which one did you see in your head? Probably if you live in the Northern Hemisphere, you saw the snow. But if you live in the Southern Hemisphere, did you know that Christmas is very sunny? <laughs> it's all about context, how we decode these messages. Oh, I know, now you're thinking, whoa, well, Adria, you're messing with my brain. And that's my intention here today. Okay, I have put a word there. What are you thinking of when you see the word that I am saying, or my Bitmoji is saying? What are you seeing? Okay, one, two, three. Did anybody see a pan? That's where you cook. All right, there's a pan once.
más. ¡Puso! ¡Pan! ¡Uy, qué rico! ¡Ese pancito delicioso! ¡Of course! Maybe sometimes if you live in a multilingual world, some of these words will elicit different thoughts in your brain. Hey, some of you may even have thought about Partido Acción Nacional. Did anybody do it? <laughs> Nobody in this group. A lot of my students always think of PAN as the Partido Acción Nacional. The truth is that we decode in context. Because language exists in context. Now, we never think about it because we're, we are submerged in it. So we don't even realize how we are decoding or what we are presenting. When we live in a society that creates a context, people talk, and then those talks express experiences, values, stereotypes, preconceptions, and even what we are taught. And it just keeps recycling and recycling. We're inside, so we don't really notice all the, all the, all the ways that we um, experience language and the ways that we understand what people are saying. But the truth is, it is so fun sometimes to get out of the glass and then look in and start thinking, hmm, why am I thinking this way? The values uh, in my society that are making me think this way. Sometimes we change context. <laughs> and that really helps us, especially we live between two contexts. And then you think, oh, How should I interpret this? And this is what I want you to think about. Everything that is in your brain is context-based. In language, you usually have an encoder, which is the person who is creating the message, whether it's written or spoken. And then you have your decoder. But we speak and decode and interpret inside a context. There is no way around it. There is no way to escape this context. Now, if you have a couple contexts in your life, then things can get really interesting. Because these contexts also contribute to what our identity can be. So let's move to language and identity. Let's go back to the little talk you had. Okay, I want to see some hands. Who said their name to the person who they talked to? Did anybody say their name? Ah, uh, that's a usual one. How about where you were born? Anybody say, said where you were born? Oh, some of you. How about your nationality? Anybody express that? Nobody. How about your ethnicity? Did anybody say I'm Hispanic? I'm blah, blah, no, okay. How about where you live? Anybody said I live? Oh, that's a big one, isn't it? Part of our identity. How about what you do for a living? Did anybody say what you, ooh, that's a huge one. That's a very American thing, by the way. Mm -hmm. You are living in a very angle context when you talk about what you do. <laughs> How about what you study? Mm, oh, we wouldn't have that many students. So the ones on the, on the, I don't know if it's your right or your left, those are very typical of the things we say. But did anybody say their age, religious beliefs, political affiliation, marital status, parental status, hobbies, or Netflix obsession? <laughs> oh, nobody did. Yeah, we sort of reserve those for different contexts, right? If we were maybe, uh, I don't know, uh, on a date or something like that, maybe that's what we would choose to say. So what we choose to say and what we choose to keep not only has to do with our identity, but also in the context that we're in. The big thing we always say is our name. And names are such a big part of our identity. So this little person uh, dressed in pink is going to express her name. And she wants to say, hi, I'm Veronica. But now she lives between contexts, English and Spanish. And she's trying to think, should I say Veronica, like my mother used to say it, or should I say Veronica? with an anglicized pronunciation. Let's say she says, oh, I'm Veronica. And then the other person goes like, oh, like Archie's Veronica. Now let's say she says, hi, I'm Veronica. And then the other person goes like, hmm, I never heard it pronounced like that. And then they start making all these assumptions, right? Oh, she's not from here. Where is she from? Should I ask? I detect an accent. By the way, everybody has an accent of some sort. So, you know, I always enjoy it when people go like, I detect an accent.
accent. And I say, I can take an accent too. Where are you from? <laughs> so this is, these are decisions we make every day on how we are going to use our language. Now, if the other person were to share um, my bilingualism, maybe I say, hi, I'm Veronica. And then she goes, oh, like my tia Veronica. And then, bam, instant connection right there. Names are so important. What is in the name? A lot of times, a lot of identity. I want to tell you very quickly my own story. So that little creature there is me when I was little. And um, my mother was looking for a name, and she had thought of naming me Veronica. Veronica, for those of you who don't know, is the lady who wiped Jesus' tears while he was carrying the cross, and then his face was, um, came out on that piece of cloth. In my country, home country of Ecuador, in, during Holy Week, people go out on the street and do all the processions, and the Veronicas walk and cry the whole time. A lot of tears those Veronicas have. So, my mom was thinking of naming me Veronica. I was also born very, very weak. I was born of six months. So my mother decided to entrust me to the Virgin of Sorrows, La Virgen de la Dolorosa, who, as you can see, has a lot of pain going on. I mean, look at those daggers. That's pretty. Yeah. Talk about identity and context. If you have grown around this iconography, um, there's, there's things in your head, for sure. And so, her friend told her, you want to entrust her to the Virgin of Sorrows, but you want to name her Veronica? And my mother was definitely knowing she wanted to entrust me to the Virgin of Sorrows. In fact, that is my bedroom when I was growing up, and you can see what a mix of things in there, right? You have La Cenicienta, which is, I forget the name in English, the girl with the shoe and the, oh my god, what is her name? I got COVID brain. Um, well, somebody, somebody, you know the one I'm talking about. The fairy tale. So the fairy tale and the Virgin of Sorrows right there. And so this was my bedroom. But my, my mother's friend told her, oh my god, Veronica is tears. And Virgin of Sorrows is tears. Don't do that to the kid. She's going to have a really sad life. So my mother decided to name me Alegria. For those of you who didn't know, that's how it came about. So in a way, my name is a juxtaposition. I am the happiness of a virgin of sorrows, and I take this identity very, very seriously because I feel that my job in life is to bring joy even in the saddest of times. And for those of you who know me, you know I am that person. And so that is how my name came about. Imagine what a big part of my identity it is. Of course, I moved from Ecuador to the United States, and all of a sudden, my name does not translate. So, my name here <laughs> turns out to be Algeria, or Allergy, or Allegra, because people see it, and of course, they don't have the context to explore my name. But Algeria, really? Does somebody name her kid Algeria? <laughs> Come on. But this is my reality. People mess up my name all the time. And so my identity, of course, is tenuous when I am living between languages. And not to say, but how many of you had said your name somewhere <laughs> at the coffee shop and it gets slaughtered? Let me see hands. Does, has that happened to you? It has, of course. We all live in this world. All right. Well, I know your name might be a big part of your identity. So let's get back to our tables now and, and talk about this. What's your name? What language and culture does your name represent? Has your name ever been mispronounced? Does your name translate easily between languages and cultures? Do you ever wish you had a different name that maybe was easier for everybody to say? All right, let's take a minute to talk about this. I'm going to give you about three minutes, and then we'll all come back. So let's do that.
this one then? There's a 
great site called Name Coach. If you have ever seen my signature, you will see that I uh, hook into Name Coach so people learn how to pronounce my name. And they um, did the survey where they found out that during the job interview, 44% of the people uh, who responded had their name mispronounced. And of these, Hispanics were the most affected. Almost 60% of Hispanic names were mispronounced. Interestingly, 70% of the respondents said that they had problems pronouncing names as well. So for example, they didn't introduce someone to someone else because they didn't know how to say their name. That was 22% of people. Or didn't talk to a coworker for fear of not knowing how to say their name. Or did not call someone in a meeting because they did not know how to pronounce their name. Our names that are so central to our identity. How do we handle them when we live between languages and cultures? It is not an easy chore. And when we live between these languages and cultures, we have to make those decisions. By the way, I have an anglicized name for my coffee and my pizza. It's Ali. <laughs> Whatever, I don't really want to like, tell people my whole life story, right? And this is just the way, these are the decisions we have to make. But when I do that, part of my identity shifts. So, of course, when we live between languages and cultures, we are going through acculturation. How many of you have heard of acculturation? Let me see some hands. Oh, oh, all right, I won't spend too much on this. But basically, when we're talking about acculturation, we're talking about a socialization process through which we learn and adopt the values, customs, norms, attitudes, thoughts, even emotions and, and ways of acting and behaving of the dominant culture. I'll give you an example. I, I laugh very, uh, very uh, freely, and I speak very loudly, and when I'm in American restaurants, my husband's always going like, because <laughs> he gets embarrassed. Does that happen to anybody else? <laughs> it's very Hispanic to get that loud, right? But, you know, the, this is what you learn to do, even regulate your emotions. Um, so acculturation, of course, is experienced by anyone who enters a new cultural environment and must adjust to new norms, values, and systems. These changes during acculturation are on our daily behaviors, on our customs, values, ways of thinking and feeling, even our religious practices, our traditions, our food. I don't know about you, but there's lots of food that I miss from my home culture. And of course, language, which is what we're concentrating on today. There are different types of acculturation, and this is a model by John Barry where you have assimilation, which is when the individuals adopt the cultural norms of a dominant culture over their original culture. So they become, let's say you're a Hispanic, but you just became a total gringo. <laughs> okay, now separation. Individuals reject the dominant culture or host culture in favor of preserving their culture of origin. This, for example, used to happen to my mom. She, um, uh, she was able, she continued to speak in Spanish and never adapted to American culture, never. And so she was definitely on the separation front. Then you have integration, which I would say is the easiest one, when the individual is able to adopt the cultural norms of the dominant or host culture while also maintaining their culture of origin. So they're sort of teetering between both of them and you sort of change your, um, not mask, but certainly your identities as you are uh, with different people in different contexts. And the saddest one of them all, marginalization, where a person rejects both their culture of origin and the dominant culture, and they just really don't know where they fit. Now, people can do this either in, a, in their private lives or in their public lives. And so there's just a lot to acculturation. But here is the thing. Acculturation is a real phenomenon when we live between languages and cultures. And there is no better poem to express this than my beautiful friend, Charlene Garcia Sims, who I'm going to ask to come up and read this amazing poem she wrote that I use in my classes. So Charlene, you are on the spot now. Are you going to kill me? <laughs> I don't want to read it. I know you will do such a much better job. So uh, let's, li let's listen to Charlene read her amazingly beautiful poem. 
you know, you said Veronica. I want to change the name of Veronica to something else because Veronica is a mean name and you're not. <laughs> and Alegria is one of my favorite persons. I love you, Alegria. She can, you can be having the worst day in the world, dark, black, black. And she comes to the room and she lightens the room and music starts playing. And how many of you have experienced that with Alegria? She's amazing. Um, my father was Gilbert Garcia, he was a school superintendent. He was a very smart man. He lived superintendent in Cuesta, New Mexico, in San Luis, and in Araba. In Araba, they don't speak much Spanish. That's up by Lyman. So that was a really um, different experience for him. Um, he taught me Spanish, that was my first language. And then, um, you know, the English came along, he taught me to read. But the last two years, it was really weird. He died in 2001, and around 1999, he started speaking nothing but Spanish. Nothing but Spanish, it was really bizarre. And after a while, it was really me. Really, you know, all our conversations uh, were like that. And I, I wondered, when did we stop, stop speaking Spanish at home? And one night after I went to visit, he was in a rehab home, and he, uh, I was took him atole, that was his favorite. Everybody, how many know atole? Very nourishing, you know, if anybody's sick, feed him atole. And so uh, I was on my way home, and uh, he had just told me some stories about how we had lost our water rights in Garcia, and then he told me some funny stories, and, and I thought, if he had told me the stories in English, they wouldn't have been the same. So it was a, a delight to get to do this with him for the last two years of his life. So I went home, and I said, when did we start speaking Spanish in school oh. and in, you know, at home? And so I wrote this, and I wrote this on... October 27, 2000, at 8, 10 p.m. So, very specific. I, I learned that from um, an, an author, that to write the time you write this and the day. I will not speak in Spanish. I will not speak in Spanish. I will not speak in Spanish. I'm getting tired of staying after school and writing. I will not speak in Spanish. Over and over on the blackboard. Won't I ever learn? Today we ran out of blackboard space and Mrs. Royball had us write 100 times on paper, I will not speak in Spanish. What we ever learn? But it's better than last year when Sister Aloysius would have us open our hands and she would hit the palm of our hand twice with that ugly, splintered, wooden ruler of hers. I didn't have to stay up to school today. Neither did my best friend Irene nor my cousin Tomas. Each day, fewer and fewer of us are staying after school, except for Billy, who refuses to listen, but I think it's because he can't read nor write. They call him dumb. Billy hasn't been to school for a month now. We think he dropped out. This week, we have two new students, a brother and sister from Chamita. Today, they have to stay after school to write on the blackboard. I will not speak in Spanish. I will not speak in Spanish, but soon, soon, they won't have to stay after school because like the rest of us, they too will learn. I will not speak in Spanish. I will not speak in Spanish. I will not speak in Spanish. Thank you. getting more and more beautiful. I see that I have a, a, a previous version of what you read and I love what you've done with it. Thank you so much for sharing. This poem is so powerful. I often ask my students how it feels to live between languages and cultures. These are some of the things that they tell me. The bicultural life is interesting but also difficult. It comes with lots of problems and laughter. Living in two worlds, I am always too American for my Hispanic culture, but too Hispanic to be American. I have the power to connect the two worlds, but it is not easy. This was an 18-year-old boy. Can you believe this wisdom? I sure can't. And here's another student. I think that being bicultural can be good and bad. We can connect with more people when we are bicultural, but sometimes that connection is very weak because our personal cultures are scrambled. There are times that I feel I have no place because I am the only one in my family who is connected with the American culture, and this makes me different than the rest of them. 
Also, my family teases me a lot and makes jokes that I am very gringa. It didn't used to bother me so much before, but little by little, it makes me feel farther away from my family and my Mexican culture. So wise as well. And lastly, I want to share this poem. This is Brian McDonald. He is now an amazing, amazing veterinarian in our community. You wouldn't be able to tell with the name Brian McDonald and those red, red hairs that he has on his head, but his mom and his grandma are Mexican. And that is what he chose to write about. I am going to read it because I just think it's one of the most beautiful poems. Para conocerme es necesario conocer mi nombre porque mis nombres muestran la mezcla de mis herencias. To many who know me not well enough, me llamo Brian. Para mi madre, me llamo Mijo. To my dad, me llamo Spud. Para mis hermanas, me llamo B. To trouble, me llamo Kitchener. Para mi abuelita, me llamo Flaco. And to my grandpa, me llamo Cowboy. Sin embargo, para conocerme mejor, me pregunto, ¿Quién soy yo? I am the past. Yo soy el futuro. Mi abuelita me dice que soy mexicano, mientras la otra me dice que soy escocés. My skin deceitfully lies to those who look at me. Ellos me gritan gringo, for they are ignorant and cannot see the true color of my blood. Mi sangre llora la verdad a través de mis cortes. Me lo susurra. Tu bisabuela era un inmigrante ilegal de México. Sadly, discrimination attempted to kill her español. Sin embargo, su español ha sobrevivido el tiempo y ahora sus palabras caen libremente de tus labios. With another heartbeat, my blood travels across the ocean a las montañas brumosas de Escocia, brumosa como esa herencia mía. Lost through time and space, yet is still what everyone sees in me. Mi herencia real está atrapada detrás de mentiras, pero es la herencia que yo vivo cada día. You can look at my skin and listen to the screaming lies. Pero si realmente quieres conocerme, puedes escuchar los susurros de mi sangre. Oh. Wow, right? I know. Brian is amazing. And he really exposed, not only through his story, but by using language and uh, his language between Spanish and English, his identity and the conflicts that he has. These conflicts are not unusual. When I ask my students on a small study I, I, I created, do you ever feel you don't belong fully in either culture? You can see that the great majority said either yes sometimes or yes all the time. Only 15% did not. When I asked, do you feel res uh, responsibility to represent your people? you can see the great majority did all the time, or at least sometimes. Also, I asked them, has everyone ever questioned your alliance to your home culture because of this acculturation we have to live through? And you can see that 68% said yes, people have questioned them. Or do you ever feel you are betraying your culture by assimilating to the dominant culture? 78% believe they do. Talking about languages, I've asked them, do you ever feel your language, your home language is broken? Look how many believe it is. Because of course, English has become dominant. I asked him, has anyone ever asked you to, to, to stop speaking your home language and speak English? And 45% have had that horrible experience. Did you ever feel embarrassed by your family speaking your home language in public? And a quarter of them did at some point. So of course, living between languages and cultures can be incredibly difficult, but also incredibly beautiful. This one is very interesting to me. Has anyone ever made fun of your home language skills? And you can see that more than half had had this happen. Because of course, if you grew up with Spanish at home and then English becomes dominant, you are going to struggle with some of your language skills in Spanish. It is the most natural thing. But a lot of people believe that you should speak like a native because your family speaks it or because you're Hispanic, which is not even the case. And look at who are the people making fun of the, our students. Friends, family, strangers, and 
even teachers. So, of course, when it comes to language, there is just a lot, a lot of pain that goes in there. And this is why it's important that we talk about critical language awareness. Are we ready to move to this topic now? Yes, I see you all, thank you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you back there, yay. All right, so it is important to understand where language and relationships of power stand. So every society has a system of hierarchies where groups with more power establish ways of seeing the world and value systems to follow. These practices, in many cases, do not take into account the needs and valuable contributions of groups with less power. This is just a matter of fact. This is how our society works. Now, when it comes to language, understanding how power relations dictate who can speak, how we can speak, when we can speak, where we can speak, and even what we can say is crucial. Only when we understand how power relations work within language systems, we can give voice and value to those who have been denied voice and value. Let me give you some, some instances and tell me if you, have, um, if you have lived this or know somebody who has. Two Hispanic friends are in a supermarket and start talking in Spanish when a man approaches them and yells, this is America, speak English. Has anyone lived that or knows of somebody who has? Yeah. Heartbreaking, but it happens. A family where the parents speak English and Spanish decides to only speak English at home, thinking that this will help the children be accepted. Anybody has seen this one happen? Wow, look how many of us. All right. The Mexican cousins of a Hispanic boy who grew up in the United States and whose dominant language obviously is English, make fun of his Spanish. Has anybody experienced or seen that happen? When they go to the, ha, huh? yes. Wow. How about an Anglo teacher cannot pronounce the name of one of her Hispanic students and announces that in her class, she will call him by a different name? Has anybody seen that one? Whoa, whoa. I'm surprised at that many hands, but yeah, it's still happening. Let's go to four other scenarios. In a country where the vast majority of people have indigenous roots, school systems try to eradicate native languages because this bilingualism is not considered prestigious. Instead, everyone is expected to speak the language of those who colonize the territory. Has anybody seen this? Of course you have, because you're all speaking English. And perhaps some of you. <laughs> The, uh, spoke Spanish or even native languages. But I'll tell you what, English is not the only oppressing language. English is the oppressing language here. But if you go to Latin America, actually Spanish is the oppressing language, oppressing all our native languages in Latin America. So it's all about relationships of power. Okay, let's look at another one. A child who arrives from another country and enters a school does not receive support in her native language and her learning is delayed despite having a high level of intelligence. Has anyone seen that happen? Yes. It's heartbreaking, isn't it? How we are not serving these beautiful children and uh, not let, letting them live to their maximum potential. Okay, another one. A young woman speaks English mixed with Spanish and the, with the rest of her bilingual friends. So, Spanglish. And her elders consider this an outrage. She is destroying both languages. Have you heard that? People who don't speak, don't fix the languages. <laughs> okay, I have a great story for you on that. <laughs> Lastly, a teacher corrects a student who uses a word that his entire family uses. The teacher explains, that is not how you say it. Even though in that student's home and in his community, that's exactly how you say it. I'm gonna tell you about a few words we see. Yarda. And teachers go, you don't say yarda. And I'm like, yeah, say yarda. Oh, my family says yarda. What are you talking about? It's a word. Has anybody experienced something like that or heard it? Yeah? Wow. Over there on the right, there's a lot of people who have experienced most of these. These are not born, these value systems and these condemnations are not born out of nowhere. They are born within a context in a context where there are relationships of power. 
let me tell you a story. And I don't know if, my, if the mother of this beautiful child is still sitting there. She might be. Um, but this is uh, this little boy from Ecuador, and the mom decided she was going to teach him Spanish. And then she signed him up in a uh, school where they were going to teach him Spanish, and she was so excited. He is, of course, learning Ecuadorian Spanish. And then the teacher one day in the class told the other students, in this class, we're going to learn Spanish from Spain, so don't talk like him. What does that do to that child? Well, fortunately, in this case, not too much, because the parents were incredibly smart and continued to support this boy, who now is a proud graduate. Go, uh, what are the wasps? I, the, 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 the little flying insects from county. <laughs> Hornets. <laughs> um, just graduated, beautiful bilingual boy. He is right now in uh, Ecuador, speaking in Spanish and English, and even, I understand, making some conquests with girls because he can pick up girls in Spanish <laughs> and English. Talk about a great advantage of being bilingual. And so he was very fortunate to have a family who did not allow this prejudice to um, hinder his language and his pride for being bilingual. But this type of attitude is everywhere. Here is a, 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 a post that came out about J-Lo. J-Lo only calls her, by, by the way, I love J-Lo, so nobody mess with my J-Lo, including Ben Affleck, don't mess with my J-Lo. So J-Lo only calls herself Latin for more publicity and attention. She can barely speak in Spanish, yet alone her interviews in Spanish are so reversed, and she fumbles like crazy reverting to English. Horrible presentation of a Hispanic woman. Bring back Shakira. <laughs> you know, here, we get, we see this typical attitude that if you're Hispanic, you're supposed to speak Spanish. This is a very, very hard measure to live up to because we live in a society where our bilingualism is squashed at every turn. And the fact that JLo was not able to preserve her Spanish does not make her any less of a Hispanic. And the fact that she's even trying to do it should be celebrated. But you can see how this is out there in the world and how this would affect us. Of course, the prejudice is everywhere. This particular politician said, we should replace bilingual education with immersion in English so people learn the common language of the country. So they learn the language of prosperity, not the language of living in a ghetto. I don't even want to address the ignorance of this statement, given that Spanish is spoken all around the world by an array of people of every group and economic status and everything else. But this is the kind of ignorance that we have to confront all the time. So we should replace bilingual education with immersion in English. Well, I have a different per, uh, perspective. We should expand linguistic repertoire, so people's linguistic repertoire, so they develop their bilingualism and their ability to function across cultures, so they become extraordinary humans, able to understand words and ideas incomprehensible to others, able to move from culture to culture with an open heart and a recognition that despite differences, we are all worthy of understanding and respect. I like that a lot. And I think you do too. Yes. I think you do too. So I get asked, which is the best Spanish, Professor Rivadaneda? And you know what people don't realize when they're asking me this? Is that they have fallen into the hierarchies of language and power. Because what they're really asking is what type of Spanish has prestige? And what type of Spanish has stigma? And how do we determine prestige and stigma? Well, in Spanish, usually it's the colonizer's variety. So Spanish from Spain usually is seen as a prestige variety. Also, the Spanish from Mexico from the Efe, because that's the one that shows up in all the newscasts. You see this in English as well? Of course you do. There is a variety of English and a certain accent in English that has more prestige than others. And when people speak with stigmatized varieties, then they get judged. But truly, these value systems are anchored in relationships of power. And so I would say, in a way, it's completely arbitrary. Just because 
Oh, and you're going like, uh, yeah, why do you have ice cream cones up there? Is anybody asking that right now? Yeah. <laughs> well, because, listen to me, there's a reason, I promise, I promise. Let's think of language as ice cream. So, all kinds of Spanish are ice cream, whether you speak San Luis Valley Spanish, Ecuadorian Spanish, Mexican Spanish, Chilean Spanish. They are all Spanish. A value system has decided that fresa, that strawberry, is the prestige variety. But the truth is, all of these are valid, all of these are important, and all of these are the varieties that we should be using in our daily lives according to where we are. Let me ask you this. If, a, if somebody was to tell you, so what is the correct way of saying it? Writing book or notebook? What is the correct way of saying modern way or highway? What is the correct way of saying loo, bathroom, or restroom? Eraser or rubber? Barrel, trash can, dustbin, rubbish dump, or snap beans, green beans, or string beans? Or, hey, what's up? Hello, good evening. <laughs> they are all valid. Of course they are. The reason we choose one or another usually has to do with where we are and if we're being formal or informal. Isn't that the truth? So I always tell my students, what is the correct Spanish? It's not about what is the correct Spanish. It's about what is the appropriate language to use according to a situation. You would not wear swimming suits to a night gala, but you would not wear beautiful gowns and tuxedos to the beach. So it's more important to understand what language choices we make. There is an idea of eradication in our society where people say you have to stop talking the way they taught you at home and you have to speak a prestige variety. No, never. Do not stop talking the way you talk at home. We are not going to eradicate your variety. We can add to your variety, so then you can make your language choices. So let's we'll just get you a few more clothes. We have our Spanglish day, which is one of the varieties that seems to be growing more and more. <laughs> and here at the university, we uh, celebrate our Spanish uh, Spanglish days. How many of you mix Spanish and English when you're talking? Let me see hands. Does anybody do it? I hope you do it, and I hope you do it with pride. Because guess what? You just might be the pioneers of what will become what is now a baby language and what will probably become what we will be speaking in 500 years. Guess what? Languages are not static. They are always evolving. If they did not evolve, everybody who speaks Spanish right now would be speaking Latin. If the languages didn't evolve, you would all be speaking like Shakespeare when you're speaking English. Of course we don't. For those language purists out there who believe there's only one way to speak, I would tell them, you cannot stop language evolution. You cannot. And you cannot stop language varieties. And this is so important to express to the people in our lives who are living between languages and cultures. How are we doing on time? Hmm, I think we can do one more. Let's do the, well, hmm, I got 10 minutes, huh? Okay, I'm going to skip this one. I know you're dying to talk about language and power. Maybe you can do it during your break, all right? So I'm going to skip this conversation and I'm just going to go very quickly through some of the things that we are doing here at our institution in our Spanish program to preserve and expand our languages. So by now you probably have realized that there are very different types of um, language learners. We have people like Sarah, for example, who did not learn Spanish at home and has no cultural connection to Spanish. She decided to start learning it at the university. Sarah is what we call a second language learner. Then we have somebody like Daisy, who came to the United States when she was 12. She grew up in Mexico, spoke Spanish, she got here, and then, of course, the, our monolingual system tried to beat the Spanish out of her, 
and then he became English dominant. And she is in my Spanish class trying to recuperate and get stronger with her bilingualism. But she already has a lot. She's what we would call a heritage language learner because it's the language she grew up with at home and even in a country where that was a dominant language. But English became dominant. And then we have Eddie. Eddie grew up in New Mexico. His parents did not speak Spanish anymore. His grandma did, and he still remembers how she used to sing to him. He is actually learning it in a classroom setting. But of course, he has a strong attachment to Spanish because it's the language of his ancestors, it's the language of his heart, and it's the language of his grandma. He's also a heritage language learner. He is a heritage language learner who needs to learn his language in a classroom setting. So as a Hispanic serving institution, we have an extraordinary opportunity and a profound responsibility to empower and celebrate heritage language learners on our campus and in our communities. And I am so proud of everyone in my program who is Team Awesome and does this, and also at our university. When this is not done, there can be a lot of sorrow in somebody's life. If you have not seen this, um, this poem, you can look it up. It's called Dear White Girls in My Spanish Class. And at the end of the poem, she says, I am here in yet another Spanish class, desperately reaching for a language I hope will choose me back someday. What is it like to be a tourist in the halls of my shame? To not be expected to speak better than you do? To visit Mexico and not care that people mistake you for being from somewhere else? How does it feel to take a foreign language for fun? To owe your history nothing. Isn't that incredibly powerful? Of course, this poor girl was not in a class like the classes that we run here at the university, where we explicitly acknowledge the different stories of language acquisition that everybody's bringing, so nobody feels more than or less than, whether they learn it from their abuelita, from traveling, from studying, from El Chavo del Ocho, or from Dora la Exploradora. We make sure that we address the usual abilities of each of the groups. While second language learners are strong with formal Spanish, grammar, and reading and writing, heritage language learners are more at ease with formal Spanish cultural literacy and usually listening and speaking if they have done it at home. And so nobody needs to be competing with anybody. Everybody needs to know they're coming from a different place. And when they do, great things happen. Look at what one of my students said one day. I love it. She says, all my life I had asked myself what was my place within the language of Spanish. Finally, I discovered it, thanks to my friends and teacher in my phonetics class, that I'm a heritage speaker. Now that I know this, I want to study it more, especially because I know that there can be different forms of speaking among the people that speak the language. <laughs> How great is that? She realized she does not need to be a native speaker because she's not. She's not a native speaker. Those expectations that she has felt even within her family are absolutely messing with her head. Because whether, whether she um, learned it in a classroom setting or at home, she's a different kind of speaker than a native speaker who is in a country where that is the dominant language and their schooling happens in that language. It is a very different situation. She is a perfect heritage speaker, and now she knows it. Exploring cultures and languages in your classroom can make your students realize how they are, what they are supposed to be. This one is from my um, Spanish for Health Professions class. We were just running it this summer, and we were talking about how, <laughs> tell me if this is true to you if you are Hispanic. When somebody's sick in your family, everybody has an opinion, and when they're in the hospital, the whole family goes to see them. Do you, have you experienced that? Yeah. Oh, a few of you. I see some nods. Okay. So they were doing a reading, and one of my students says, this reading makes me realize that my family's not crazy. <laughs> that we, what we do is something very Hispanic for everyone in our family to have an opinion about health situations and decisions of a family member. So it is important that people see themselves recognized, because then they can embrace their multiplicity. 
Education and awareness can help them navigate their identities and contextualize, challenge, and redefine a lot of the labels that they have received throughout their lives. They will know that they are resilient, that they're adaptable, that they have a super brain, that they are a bridge, that they have an edge, that they have a gift. Instead of having been made feel less than, which our schooling system has done for lots and lots of years. So when we are doing language study and we do identity exploration at the same time, I believe that it becomes crucial that our students understand where they, who they are. Because if you don't understand who you are and the gifts you can share with the world, you will not reach your full potential. And the world will miss out in your awesomeness. So this is a big, big um, responsibility that we have as educators. Let me show you a few things that my students have done. Oh, we're almost out of time. So I'm just going to show you very quickly. Music and art project, music um, identity projects where we talk about what songs create our identity. And it can be Los Pedernales, Pink Floyd, El Pollito Pio, and Hakuna Matata. Talk about a great mixed identity. We also can do things like songwriting when we talk about our identities. Full identity web pages that my students have done where they talk about how part of their lives are tortillas, frijoles, de la rosa mazapan, pizza, pumpkin pie, because that is our identity. Community stories and recipes where we can share the stories of our community and the delicious um, things that we have um, created uh, in, with food. Business guys that celebrate Hispanic businesses in our community. Children's stories that teach other children. These are some of the books my students have written um, uh, about identity and bilingualism and language variation and diversity and where people are from. Oral history projects that address uh, specific aspects of Hispanics within history. Book of Home Remedies, which I already looked up because they have great COVID uh, uh, things that I can try out. And even things for mal de ojo, if anybody wants to look at these. Where can you find these? These are part of our open educational research that, resources that we've been doing, where we are addressing both our students' financial needs, but also their lived experiences. Our mission is that no student taking Spanish at our Hispanic serving institution will ever have to pay for a textbook again. Our mission is that our students will see their lives and cultures reflected in our textbooks. Our mission is that our pedagogical approach will match their learner needs and that the content of our courses will be relevant to their interests. So if you want to see any of these, you, uh, these are the Valientes, Tatiana is there, you can ask her about her because she's one of the authors. And you can find our website at csupworldlanguages.org where you can uh, go through all these books and explore whatever you want. But why do, we, why do we do this? Why would we do all this crazy stuff? Well, we do it because of them. They deserve the best, nothing less than the best. So then they can go into the world and share their beautiful, multiple identities and contribute in ways that they never could if they were to suppress their whole selves. We don't have time to share this, but I'll invite you to do it also while you're on your break. What are you ready to do to preserve and expand your languages and those of your communities? Hmm, I want to hear what you are going to say. So in fact, I am going to leave it, so if anybody during the break wants to send me a message in your Nearpod, you will be able to share that with me. spending uh, this great um, time with your uh, friends, with the people you're just getting to meet. I can't wait for you to listen to the rest of the presenters. I am so sad I don't get to be there, but they're going to send me a recording, so I'm really excited to see that. If you want to find me, Alegria Rivadeneira, csupueblo.edu, website with alegria.net, and the books at worldlanguages.org. Thank you again for being here and for caring about bilingual identities. Alegria, can you hear me? I can. I'm not in the camera. 
Uh, we just want to thank you again for your wonderful message, and it's just a privilege to work with you, and thank you for being with us today, even though you're not feeling well, and bringing this wonderful message. Um, Tatiana, will you raise your, will you wave? Uh, Tatiana Johnston is in the back, and she is a colleague of Dr. Rivadanera in our World Languages program, so if you have more questions about the the um, zero cost textbook or the curriculum or the, the uh, projects that you saw on the screen, you can ask Tatiana today or get in touch with Alegria. And um, Alegria, later today we're gonna give away two t-shirts with a, a Spanglish t-shirt and a being with me superpower. So just, just for you. Oh, thank you so much. And outside, Tatiana set up a table with some really, really pretty goodies that are for you uh, about developing your bilingual superpowers. So make sure you grab one uh, from our English and World Languages Department. Thank you so much. All right, join me in thanking Alegria. Thank you. So we're going to give you um, 10 minutes to just take a short break. There's still coffee, juice, water. Um, if you need a, a bathroom break, and we're going to start back up at exactly 10 o'clock with Dr. Melissa Ravienes. Thank you so much. <laughs>